Вечная In the year 1666, a great schism divided the Russian Orthodox Church. A patriarch of Moscow forced reforms upon the church, reforms in traditional text and ritual. But pious millions refused to accept these reforms because a change in outward ritual would mean a change in inner faith. These people, known as old believers, were persecuted as enemies of the Tsar. Some were tortured and burned at the stake. Others fled to the wilderness and to foreign lands. Their descendants continue to live according to the written acts of ecumenical councils that met over a thousand years ago, setting down the doctrines, church services, and rules for living. came to Oregon in the 1960s to preserve their way of life. They had kept the faith of their ancestors for 300 years, living apart and migrating thousands of miles across the world. Here in the Willamette Valley, they settled near one another, in towns and on farms. With hard work, they bought homes and land. <laughs> Today, the people live as a community, maintaining their church, rituals, and traditions. Fringed belts, beards, and hairstyles have biblical origin. Their dress reflects peasant costume of 17th century Russia and religious belief. But only the older men and women have ever lived in Russia. One who remembers the homeland is Fyodora Solodkova. I was born in Russia, in the village Kamenka in the Maritime Province. There was bread, there were cattle, nothing more. In the winter it got very cold with lots of snow. If we needed something, we went to Spask in the winter. The salt, goods, or some pretty boots. Then in the summer we picked berries. And there were wildflowers there. All the fields were so beautiful. There were forests too big to cross. There were rivers and fish in the rivers. Good fish and lots of them. Then we went to China, near Harbin. We crossed the border and lived there. Why? There was a revolution. My parents left, the people left. I was 13 years old. We faced all kinds of situations. Mainly they required hard, heavy work, work on the land, no machines. Grandchildren liked best to hear about the time when my husband was a hunter and I was at home. The men sold tigers to zoos and to the Chinese for medicine. When communists gained power in the 1950s, the families escaped, hidden in trucks and on foot. From Hong Kong, some resettled in Australia and New Zealand. Most migrated to Brazil. Kirill Kutsev was a young man then. Today he's a farmer, tree thinner, fisherman, and cantor of his church. He recalls for his son, Stepan, the events that took them to the hot, dry climate of Brazil, where rice crops failed 
and the people went hungry. It was really hard, to, you know, to live there. So far, we know, you know, the best place to live is in America, like in the United States. Nobody, you know, tells us, you know, not to be living back. Other old believers had come from central China, still others from Turkey, where they've lived 200 years. In Oregon, three groups found a culture in common, preserved from a time before Peter the Great. Soon after harvest, weddings begin. When a boy is to marry, his family prepares Braga, a Russian wine made from the berries. The marriage traditions are very old, echoing countrysides of long ago, when a wedding and its celebration, the Svadba, kept a whole village entertained for days. Weddings today repeat the ancient patterns. On Sunday afternoons, the park is a meeting place. Engagements can happen suddenly, sometimes after a visit away from home. Families in Oregon keep close ties with relatives in Brazil, Australia, Alaska, and Canada. Fevrusa Kuznetsov's family left Oregon several years ago. I was 11 years old when we moved to Canada. I came here for a visit. Then when I met Andy at the party, he asked me to get married about a week later after I met him. I said, wait a little while and know each other a little bit better. Then I asked him if, you know, if he could come to Canada with me to meet my mom and dad. Then we talked to my parents and they gave me permission to get married. After the contracting of the marriage, the Devishnik begins, a time of preparation usually lasting a week. Traditionally, the girls sew and sing folk songs. In the evening, the boys come to visit. On the first day of the Devishnik, the bride's friends come and make her crocetta of soft silk. The headdress symbolizes her last days of girlhood and beauty. She asks her best friend to be her padruga, whose traditional role was protection. A bride must have new clothes, dresses for the svadba and for her married life. Her aunts, cousins and girlfriends gather to help with the work. Garments are made without patterns. Fabric is torn or cut to fit the body. Tiny pleats will shape the fullness of a dress. To the groom, the bride gives new shirts. To the groom's family, she will take gifts. Aprons or scarves to the women, belts to the men. The exchange of gifts symbolizes the union of families. Christian folk wear belts. You must always have a woven belt on you. Belts are given for baptism and then for getting married and again for getting buried. So that comes to three times. When I learned to weave, I was 10 years old. I learned from my mother. We taught everything to each other. There are many Russian people here, and nobody knows how to weave belts. In general, they work in factories, and it's hard. The young now cannot weave. It's only the old. And furthermore, the young aren't interested. They can work one day and earn enough money to buy two belts. In China, everyone wove belts for himself. When we went to Brazil, people started to get, well, a little better off. And when there's money, it's better to buy than to make it yourself, right? And then we came to America. People really started getting rich. In America, everybody buys their belts. If there is to be a wedding, then they buy 15 to 20 belts. There's the belts the bride gives to the groom. There's a number right there. And the rest they give to the uncle, the father-in-law, the aunt, the brothers of the groom. It takes a lot. 
There's weaving on cards and pickup and braided and the kind braided on bottles. Now my grandchildren are learning from me too. Only they don't want to. They have no time. They're in school all the time. All the schooling. When is there time to teach them anything? Traditionally, girls marry when they are 13, 14, or 15 years old. By the time they marry, they know how to cook, sew, embroider, and care for babies. During the Devishnik, the bride's chest fills with handwork linens and clothing. A girl prepares from the time she's age six or seven. She needs to know how to embroider shirts and blouses and decorate her home. Skill with a needle shows that a woman can use her hands creatively. On entering a house, a person first stops to pray before the icon corner, acknowledging the presence of God in the house. Embroidered panels hang beside the icons. Igolichki is done on the fabric's reverse side. Old Believer men adapted the hypodermic needle for this embroidery. In Oregon, the embroidery is vibrant. Sometimes designs come from greeting cards. Early work done in China was more abstract. changing to vivid flowers and fruit in the tropical climate of Brazil. On Friday, the last night of the Devishnik, Friends and relatives come to the bride's house to congratulate the couple and say farewell. Soon the bride will no longer wear the single braid of unmarried girls. After marriage, her hair will be worn in two braids, covered with a shashmura and scarf. She is leaving her own family and friends to live in the house of her husband's parents. One time of life ends, another begins. Fevrusa is marrying Antip Alagaz, whose family came from Turkey. Her own parents were born in China and later married in Brazil. Now Antip and Fevrusa sit at the Devishnik table in the poses of their ancestors. The girls sing very old Devishnik songs for the bride and groom. They play a game with the boys who pay for their songs with money and kisses. The elders see a difference between religious rituals and folk traditions. They tend to frown on Devishnik parties and the fooling around. The groom's parents also get people together and they prepare the braga and start making the things ready to feed guests. Many of our Russian people have a great number of relatives and they want to invite them all. This is Christian love. Often the groom's family slaughters a cow or a lamb. The Alagazes also build a new outdoor stove for the cooking. To prepare several meals for the 100 to 200 invited guests, the women cook for days. Food traditions vary. Meatballs from Turkey, Pilmeni from China and Siberia, Piroshki from Russia, and Braga made from the berries.
Building a plastic-covered shed for the wedding feast is a new tradition that began in Oregon. It came about when a home was no longer big enough to hold the guests because of so many relatives through intermarriage. Now, a special shed is always built. The saying goes, in case of rain, no one will get wet. After the work is done, on the eve of the wedding, the groom comes to collect the bride. Hundreds of years ago in Russia, the selling of the bride was for entertainment during the farewell to her family and friends. Now on Saturday night, Antip has arrived with his driver, his spokesman, and a woman attendant. Each person has a role to play. Antip's party bargains to buy the bride's crocida, the bride herself, and her single braid. Fevrusa sits covered by a shawl. Her younger brother represents her. The Shvazga peeks to be sure it's really Fevrusa. Sometimes tricks are played. Most of the money goes to the bride's friends who helped her prepare for the wedding. A chain forms a bride, groom, and attendants, symbolized by a scarf. The chain must remain unbroken till the end of the wedding day. Fabrusa's godparents are standing in for her parents, who are in Canada. The wedding party leaves for the groom's church a few miles away, where they'll join the regular early Sunday morning service in progress. Then, afterward, the marriage ceremony is performed. The people have asked that their sacred services not be filmed. On Sunday morning, after the ceremony in the church, the celebration begins. About 11 o'clock, Fabrusa's relatives arrive with her trunk, which they must sell to Antip and deliver into the house. His relatives serve food and braga to the sellers and coax them in with the trunk. Without the wine, they'd refuse to move. Long ago, humorous skits followed a wedding. Sometimes still, young men dress up in costume to add to the jesting. When at last the price is agreed on, the sellers must find every excuse they can for delay and more Braga, till finally the trunk gets carried through the door. Стоять, раздавать. Проходи! 
А я один спирал сзади, куда мой? Пожалуйста, жопу ей. Сзади все отрастил, можно лезть. А то сейчас пилы зарезу. The groom's mother, Abdukeya Alagaz, is a widow. Throughout festivities, a large, supportive family helps her. Within the next hour, her house is redecorated with the handiwork from Favrusa's trunk. The bride's relatives hang the embroidered pictures and hand-sewn curtains to be admired. A special seat is arranged for the Pakloni, the ceremony of giving gifts to the newlyweds and advice about how to live. Traditionally, members of the groom's family get tossed to the ceiling to congratulate them on a new daughter-in-law. The Shvazka standing next to Fabrusa receives gifts on a tray as the bride and groom don't receive things with their own hands. The other Shvazka takes gifts away and invites other guests to take their places for giving. Eventually, the money paid for the bride's trunk is returned. When the Tisachka speaks for the couple, giving thanks for gifts and advice, Antip and Favrusa bow down. Gifts, often money, are generous. Now, Antip's uncle speaks to them. The svadva lasts two days or more, and the giving continues. For everyone, this wedding is important. Antip and Favrusa begin their life together with new places in the community. The children learn how things are done. Their turn will come, and the elders reminisce about times past. The shared work and festivity draw people together to renew friendships, mold traditions, and sustain a way of life. After the celebration of a svadka comes to a close, everyday affairs resume. Living in the midst of American society, old believers have seen much change in 15 years. The group has grown to 5,000 people. Economically, everyone is better off. But here in the modern setting, it's hard to keep the old traditions and values. Some families moved on to Alaska and Canada. Many local industries employ Russian seamstresses, such as this sportswear factory. 
to me is a very big difference between Canada and Oregon. You know, you don't have everything, like, in Canada, like, you have everything in Oregon. I prefer to live down here. Well, I'd like for my children is to have the same life as I had. I had everything I wanted. They'd have to stay in the religion. That's the way I was brought up, and I never forgot my religion. I'd be happy if they wouldn't forget their religion, too. <laughs> Ну, готова набысть ему ковечные с прелюбодеи и соидолослужители, и с разбойники, и душу свою погубит пьяница, мнозибо и в первых родях погибоша пьянством, уходницы Божие и царь, и царь свои зринушася, святители святительства погубиша. Многолетний вскоре умрошь обезбожие суда напрасно. The only thing I want is to be able to preserve our religion as our grandfathers and our fathers before us did, so that it will be that way for our children. It's really hard for uh, young people down here for Russian religion, because, um, you know, we, we can't, you know, like, go out, you know, like, drink and smoke, all that stuff. So it's really hard right now. Ну, конечно, я думаю, что думаю, что каждый человек, который умный человек, он молится. But it is possible to maintain the old lifestyle. Every person who is intelligent prays to God. Не пил, не курил, работал. It's best not to drink, not to smoke, to work calmly. По-моему, это так. It's like that, in my opinion. The old believers' heritage lives on. Svadbas continue through late autumn and on between the times of fasting. To survive, old believers have lived many places in the world, accommodating to other cultures. Yet they have preserved their own. once fled for their lives carrying the icons and holy books so the old ways could pass on to the young. The children learn the rituals and traditions that express life's values. Yet the children attending school today learn new knowledge and different ways. As they find their way in the world, what will their future be? Like their forebears, they find challenges of their own and life goes on. Эх, 